You're listening to the Autism Weekly Podcast. Each week we share community voices and bring light to stories that increase awareness, acceptance, equity, access, and inclusion. If you haven't already subscribed to join the Autism Weekly family, I'm your host, Jeff Skibitsky. This week we're joined by Katie York, also known as the Distracted Autistic. Katie is also the founder of Harford County Neurodivergence, a community group located in Maryland. Katie is an educator, student, advocate, and community organizer with nearly 15 years experience in community college workforce training programs. Katie's autistic voice will help us explore the diverse interests of neurodivergent communities. Katie, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Um, for visual description, I'm a white femme presenting person in my mid 30s. Of chin length brown hair and a side shave in the picture. Um, I'm wearing red glasses and I have both my lip and nose pierced. My pronouns are they, she. Oh, thank you, Katie. Um, now, before we get into, you know, the topic at hand, one thing I'd love to be able to do for our listeners is, is give a little bit of a background of, of what brought about your passion? What brought about the desire to make sure that your voice and those that you advocate with are heard? Can you tell us a little bit of something about being diagnosed late with autism and, and maybe how that affected your life? I think for a lot of parents, you know, my story might seem kind of familiar in that um, my now teen uh, was was identified as being neurodivergent and that kind of led me on a, a similar journey. Um, I'm multiply neurodivergent and growing up, I always knew I was different and that sometimes, you know, I struggled with things that other people did not, but they didn't actually, you know, know what that difference might have been called or was. Um, I was diagnosed with ADHD after college and that made a lot of things make sense, um, but didn't really address everything. Um, probably about a maybe almost a decade later, uh, I was in a Facebook um, ADHD support group. And there was a post where someone just was describing something that just really resonated with me with some of my personal struggles. And someone had asked the poster if they'd ever thought that, you know, while it sounds like ADHD might be correct, could they also be autistic? And I was like, but they sound just like me. Like, I, I'm, I'm not autistic. I would know. Um, so I decided to learn more about autism to see why they might have suggested that. And kind of around that same time, um, my then elementary school age child who uh, they use they them pronouns um, and have given me permission to talk about it. Uh, they were referred by their pediatrician for a neuropsych eval already having a diagnosis of ADHD as well. But based on some discussions with the pediatrician, we thought there might be some more things there. Um, and so I kind of was just trying to read everything I get my hands on about autism and realized how it sounded really familiar. Um, and so kind of by the time my child was formally diagnosed as autistic, I realized that I was as well. Um, but I only received my formal diagnosis maybe about three or so years ago. And during that time, I kind of saw that a lot of the supports and resources that were kind of provided to me were focused on children or their presumed allistic adults um, or non-autistic adults. And so I felt like there just kind of seemed like there was a gap of if there was something directed towards adults, um, it was assuming this is, I'm explaining to you what autism is because you are not. And if there was something related to autism, it was almost always excluded or geared towards children. And it just kind of felt like, yes, I fit in that space, but I didn't. Um, so I thought, you know, I can't be the only one and saw some other groups locally, but nothing local. Um, so I decided to start very creatively named Harford County Neurodivergence because it's named for the county where I reside in. Um, there's about 50 folks in, in a closed Facebook group. Uh, we meet virtually once a month and the goal is to kind of build community and connection. So I am not a licensed clinical social worker. I'm not running a support group in that sense of things, but I just knew that early on in this journey, I felt very alone um, and didn't want that for other people. And there was also a lot of things where I'm like, I wish someone had told me this sooner. And if I can, you know, do anything, can I protect, you know, perhaps like help other people or support other people so they can start from a, a you know, different level. 
Well, I love the I love the fact that that you took this challenge on, and and I couldn't agree more that the focus needs to be broader and the understanding needs to be broader, and it can't just be focused around children, although that's an important group. Uh, the the understanding and the inclusion and the mo- the accommodations to be able to create a supportive environment it, that goes across the lifespan and it goes across diagnoses it goes across who we are as individuals but i'd love to talk about a little bit on what you've seen as far as the differences as an adult who obviously can self advocate can make sure that their voice is heard, what their experience is like versus maybe a child or somebody who may have more challenging behaviors or challenging communication deficits that maybe their autism is a little bit more visible to the world around them. Is there something about being an adult who was diagnosed late that your experience is sometimes not really seen or heard the same way? I think that, you know, it is important for me as a parent and as an autistic adult to model the behaviors that I I would like to see and also um, do what I can to, you know, I I use kind of the the Girl Scout phrase, you know, make the world a better place for, you know, the people behind me kind of thing. Um, And I, I think it is important. A lot of times, um, you'll see folks claim that maybe autistic adults that kind of really reliably use mouth words or have attained a certain level of education or have a higher capitalist value because they hold down a paying job or something like that, you know, are, are speaking over the lived experiences of folks that maybe have higher support needs or don't reliably use mouth words. And for me, I try really hard to strike that balance of, um, my experience is my lived experience, and that is, you know, does have value. However, um, that is not everybody's experience. And um, trying to build community and find common interests um, with folks that maybe have different lived experience lives, but also consciously, intentionally seek out voices that are not, you know, from a maybe group that matches mine or a lived experience that matches mine and continually consciously making that decision to be in groups, you know, where I am learning about different life experiences that I don't, because that, you know, for instance, my child, um, you know, very, very high energy, fantastic kid, love him to death, but we didn't have a huge experience with um, eloping that I know is really common for some folks who are caregivers or parents of autistic children. And so I understand, you know, how that can be really terrifying, but I don't know what it's like to, you know, set something down for a moment and my kid is dashed out the door. You know, I don't have that lived experience. And so it's important to me to seek out folks with different lived experiences to be able to better inform my worldview and my advocacy, but also to help amplify those voices. If I'm in a room where someone with that lived experience is not, I can help amplify those things. So if I'm working on a project and I'm, you know, asked to suggest names for speakers, you know, I can bring in people that maybe don't reliably use mouth words, but are able to use an augmentative or tentative communication device or AAC. Or, you know, if it is a particular um, type of conference or community meeting or something like that, trying to bring in those different voices to allow those people to speak, type, whatever, for themselves as much as possible. Because um, advocacy is not speaking for, speaking over. It's amplifying, speaking with. And when you're in the room and those people are not asking why, getting those people in the room and continually um, making sure that they're being supported or not just being used as a single token voice. Right. And that same concept is something that we explored in a previous episode when I was talking with somebody about the, the overall vision of autism. It's always been seen on a spectrum. We know that, you know, it's uh, the autistic 
kind of characteristics vary differently based off of who you are, what your experience is, what your what your lived experience and what your environment looks like. And I think that that same voice, and I'm glad that you're describing it that way, is is that the advocacy world is on a spectrum as well, is that being able to really give a voice to everybody's experience helps us to tailor a little bit better how the community can respond. Um, I'd love to be able to hit a little bit on the work experiences because as in your workforce training programs is that you have to be able to engage the community. You have to be able to really look at strength-based assessments and understand where somebody's passion is, and where they can contribute within the workforce in a way that they find meaningful. Um, how do you go about blending the community need and the community education component with trying to be able to empower each of the individuals that you're working for at, for that workforce training piece? I think one of the, the aspects I try to, you know, bring into to my work is that um, there there are places for for all sorts of people and I, I believe that that um a paid job outside the house is not necessarily um make someone worthy or unworthy you know have that value but um for a lot of folks it does bring joy and pride to be able to to contribute to something else and so i feel that that's important whether that's through you know paid position, volunteer work, or other types of um, engagement in the community. Um, it is important to me that, you know, we realize that there are going to be some things that people might have strengths in and others and try to kind of highlight those strengths while trying to um, support difficulties and challenges. Um, one thing with, you know, autism advocacy specifically that comes up a lot is that, um, the superpower narrative. And for me, I, I think of my autism as being the filter that I view everything through, you know, it's that lens for me, but it's not um, a value judgment. You know, it doesn't make me a terrible, you know, person to be pitied. It also doesn't make me this superhuman person. Um, I do have struggles and sometimes those are more or less apparent, especially, you know, in a very short podcast episode versus day to day life. Um, but it also, you know, does bring different strengths um, and perspectives as well. It's also important when I'm designing um, like curriculum and uh, hiring instructors like that, I do try to intentionally think about uh, the different people that might be in my either physical or virtual classroom and how we can make um, things more accessible to as many people as possible um, and how, uh, you know, there are some things that we are legally obligated to do as a college, but how, you know, the ADA to me, I always talk about it being, you know, the floor, it's not the ceiling. That's the bare minimum. We don't want to do the bare minimum. We want to have, you know, programs that are excellent. We want students to have an excellent experience and we want them to go out and be contributing members of society, however that may look for them in the best way possible. There's also a lot of times we talk about, and um, especially in disability studies and disability justice circles about the curb cut effect. How before the ADA was in place and it was more you know, common to see those curb cuts outside on the street that um, people when they were in, you know, thinking about this legislation and didn't have that lived experience of using mobility aids would kind of think, oh, this is just for people with wheelchairs. And that's who who it will help or support or whatever you want to say. And then as, you know, ramps and curb cuts became more common and became legally required as buildings were built, um, we see people with other types of mobility, like canes and walkers, as well as wheelchair users, but then also people with strollers and shopping carts and, you know, briefcase, suitcases, all these other people benefited by this one action. And so there's a lot of times where we make these um, adjustments with maybe one particular group or type of people in mind, but it ends up hopefully positively impacting others. 
I think that that's the refrain that you hear often is that by doing the work, maybe with it, we maybe with a focus or a passion in mind around a specific community, oftentimes that same benefit is felt across a variety of different identities. And when you're when you're working and you're running the Hartford County neurodivergent, it sounds like your emphasis has been really to try and empower everybody's voice to give a true understanding of how we can make a mark on the community and how we can make sure that we're not biased in the way that we're engaging others or in the in the opportunities that we're trying to be able to create. But how do you go about doing that? Because it can't be just work for advocates. It can't be everything put on the onus of a neurodivergent person. It's got to be the entire community at large taking on these initiatives. So how does that work with what you're doing with the Harvard County Neurodivergent? So for me, I, I think, you know, everybody is is an advocate or can be an advocate. And I'm also very big in the personal is political and not necessarily partisan politics, but that um, my lived experience can help inform uh, policies and practices for other folks, whether that's at a, you know, a job or institution that I work at, whether that is in my community and local, you know, county level things or, or up through state and federal levels. Um, with Hard for Kind Neurodivergence and other groups that I'm involved in similar to that, my goal, I, I don't want to have an echo chamber. Um, and I don't want to, again, ever say, you know, I speak for autistic people, just like I don't speak for all queer people or I don't speak for all people that work community colleges. Um, we're not all the same, but I think oftentimes we can have common goals. Um, and as long as someone is willing to learn and willing to admit when they are wrong or when they have made some kind of misstep or didn't have enough information and more knowledge about something, that we can move forward together um, with the group, particularly, um, you know, I encourage folks to share their lived experience if they feel comfortable and safe as we can all learn from each other. Sometimes just being there is enough. Um, and again, oftentimes we find we have a lot more in common than we do not, but there's definitely a variety of individual lived experiences, you know, education, age, background. Um, I would love to make it even bigger than it is, but I'm one person volunteering and I'm also working full time being a parent, a spouse, a student, and uh, trying to, to uh, make sure I'm taking care of myself as well. Well, I mean, what, what you're doing is something that I think all of us probably would benefit from, which is being able to stop, listen, understand perspectives, being able to really take a step outside of just our own viewpoint at times and understand that we're all living in the same space. We need to understand the lived experiences of everyone, but that's hard at times as well, is that um, when there are intersecting identities, when there are conflicting goals, those conversations are hard to facilitate and sometimes hard to have. Um, and you see people shouting over each other at times. You see people that just can't understand that there are different viewpoints and sometimes there's common ground and sometimes there's times where we can deviate, but we can do that responsibly. Um, how do you go about making sure that when you're facilitating some of these conversations and giving the voice to everyone that it's done in a way where there's some, I guess, social responsibility or, or kind of the ability to be able to stop, listen, and not necessarily be offended by somebody else's lived experience? I think for me, I, I try to think often about um, where other people are coming from. And a lot of time we see anger, but it's really fear or um, a lack of a lack of knowledge or information. And so people can come off being you know very angry and upset. Um, when they're actually really scared about something, whether it's something changing or something that is different than what they've experienced, or that by maybe advocating for a particular issue or concern that their issue concern may not be addressed or maybe, you know, 
there's only so much money in this particular spending bill, we can't fund everything. So um, I see that in my advocacy work in other issues like public education and, and housing and, and other um, areas that I, I choose to engage in in the advocacy work. Um, and so sometimes just trying to listen and also um, realizing that I can change my mind and I can be wrong. I can get new information and be like, wow, you know, that is not how I understood it. Or um, I was only thinking about it in this one aspect, but you're right with this additional information, I can do that. I know a lot of folks do not, but for me, I've changed my mind so many times over the years on different social issues or, or, or different even just types, you know, ways to educate and that kind of thing that, that I knew personally, I can be wrong and I, you know, years from now may change some of the views that I hold now. Um, but the goal is that I am doing that with, because new information was presented to me or different lived experience were shared with me. And so that's kind of what I want to do for other people. But yes, we will definitely not always uh, come to a, a, you know, full consensus or an agreement. Um, but I think that the biggest thing is that if someone is willing to engage, I'm willing to learn, I'm willing to be wrong. If someone else is willing to learn and also potentially be wrong, um, that's the major hurdle, I think, for a lot of social um, issues or advocacy, you know, topics. The, the idea of fear that you just presented, I, I think, is an important one for us all to take a step back and and kind of evaluate within ourselves. Yes. I see it in the treatment world is that um, as as research comes out, as we start to be able to engage those that maybe we sh should have been engaging the entire time on some of the, the treatment um, decisions and how to make things better in, in our practice, is that there's there's the, sometimes this hesitation or this fear that by doing that, it opens up a, a brand new kind of uh, thought prospect that's going to throw off everything that we've worked for. And I mean, at times you have to take that step back and realize that, you know, progress comes from listening to ideas and being able to move on and make adaptations and admitting that you're wrong at times and then figuring out how do we fix that? Um, the course of autism treatment has changed so much over time that it is this ever evolving field and you have more voices coming out saying, you know, take a look at it from this lens. Maybe you can add, maybe you can change things. Maybe you can do things differently to be able to fix it. Um, I think that's the same for community um, is that you see that with uh, developmental centers and community-based treatment and inclusion and trying to figure out how do you do this well? How do you do it appropriately? Um, and it sounds like you're tackling it with the workforce. Um, what are the what are the common fears that those who are advocates have about, you know, well, if I come out and start saying this, this puts me in this position. Um, do you hear people saying that they're silencing themselves at times just to conform? I do sometimes, especially um, because one of the other areas besides, you know, neurodiversity and particularly autism is um, LGBTQ plus um, rights and and there's a lot of um, conversation around that that I know that there are folks who um, don't necessarily feel safe speaking out at you know a public comment period or having their name um, addressed uh, you know attached to some type of um, support or um, concern or rejection of legislation or something like that, being able to provide, you know, comments in the legal system um, for true actual harm that they have experienced or that they know others have experienced and do not wish to experience that for themselves. And so for me, that's another reason why I do try to do some of the advocacy work is to help um, bring up some of those topics and concerns with the support of folks. Um, so again, not speaking over them, but sometimes, you know, I have said, I am reading something that was brought to me as, you know, a member of this community group or something like that, that they did not feel safe to speak, but I felt it was important to be heard or trying to see if there's a way that um, 
that information can maybe get to someone. They can have a conversation with, you know, the legislator or the whoever the person is in charge, whether it's, you know, somebody at a school base, but not necessarily in a large public area and still have that voice heard and that um, need hopefully addressed. Um, but there is definitely also concern about, you know, what if I mess something up or what if I am completely wrong about something? And at this point in my life, I just remind myself I've been wrong about things before. I will be wrong about things in the future. I am just willing to learn. Mm -hmm. I am willing to try to grow. Um, and if I make a mistake, you know, address and say, this is an error I have made. This was information I had that was wrong or didn't have. Um, and continue moving forward. A lot of times um, I, I choose to describe myself, you know, as a community organizer, an advocate, never an ally, because an ally is somebody who is, that title is bestowed by whatever community I am not a, port, a part of that I'm trying to support and advocate for. And it's something that is not bestowed once. You have to earn that title every day, that trust every day. Um, but even if someone, you know, calls me an ally, I don't feel comfortable describing myself as that. Um, I also like to think when we, we talk about advocacy that sometimes, you know, it, it fo we focus potentially on one area, but it really overlaps a lot. You know, Audrey Lord said it best, I think, when, you know, there's no such thing as that si single issue struggle. We don't live single issue lives. And I apologize uh, to, to Audrey Lord if I butchered that, but just that single issue struggle, a lot of times, you know, we focus on something like, LGBTQ plus rights, and then by default, we're also supporting um, neurodivergent, especially autistic people, because there's just that higher correlation. But there's also just, again, we do not live single issue lives. We can't separate out, you know, public education advocacy informs, you know, uh, curriculum and, and education, things like that, but also can inform how we think about housing and how we think about inclusion and how we can't do things just lip service and say this person is in the classroom so they're being included because they're physically there. Are they involved in the conversations? Are they being asked, you know, in however way works for them to contribute to support the learning that's happening there? Or are they just sitting in the corner but they're physically in the classroom so they're being included? A lot of the values that you're that you're sharing there as far as being able to really look at the bigger picture and that there's a lot of commonalities across all these advocacy efforts and um, a lot of it has to do with how we go about approaching and really understanding each other and that there's this domino effect. Are there specific skills that, that you kind of that, that you say, you know what, when when you're approaching some of these issues or when you're trying to really amplify what it is that, that you're experiencing or, or share that experience. These are some things that you found useful in the approach as far as how you go about doing it. I think for, for me, probably the, the biggest skill is not talking and listening um, or not typing and listening. You know, how however you get that information um, that there a lot of times where it's really easy to try to speak over someone and say that I am their voice or I'm speaking, you know, I'm the voice of my child that maybe doesn't speak or reliably use mouth words or whatever you want to say. But um, that's that's the biggest thing. And again, also being willing to change and grow, um, knowing that a lot of times there are people that have been doing this work for a while and rather than um, trying to start completely from, you know, zero blank slate, uh, trying to find out what has been done before, whether you're know, looking at legislation was something introduced previously, or whether you're looking at education, you know, is this something that a school has tried this and here's what happened? Or is there, um, you know, a community group that has a really great format that's working, you know, in another state or another area? So if like for Harford County Neurodivergence, I would love to be able to do in-person events, you know, or, or have it be a bigger group, but for me, I am able to reliably do virtual meetings. That's something that I have that capacity to do. And in the future, perhaps it will be able to be expanded or potentially it will be morphed into something else. But knowing that um, you cannot know everything, cannot fix everything, and listening to folks who have come before you 
but also knowing that a lot of times um, change does not happen overnight and it takes a lot of little successes to build up some of those big wins and we only hear about the big wins um, and that there are some times where you know we will hear someone you know introduce a law or a policy that is really hurtful um, or doesn't make much sense isn't rooted in you know best practices or whatever you want to say and it can be frustrating but knowing that um, we need to continue to move forward and keep trying and building that coalition and community with others that have similar goals and um, have areas of, of strength or experience that can help support or inform the work that you're doing. And over over the years, you've developed a, a really good way of being able to talk through, think through a lot of these concepts. But there's a lot of people out there who either haven't built the courage to start this process or maybe don't feel as if they have the platform to do so. Can you think back to maybe um, when when you were when you were a child and prior to your diagnosis? And I mean, what advice would you give to that child who's going through that lived experience, but maybe is hesitant to share their experience or to advocate or to be confident to to talk about, you know, when they feel like something's wrong? I think with kids, a lot of times we dismiss their lived experience and, and their efforts for advocacy um, because, you know, it doesn't take long for someone to realize if I've advocated for myself for something and um, no one has listened to me, I'm not going to continue to try to advocate or advocate in that way or with that person. And so it's really important to me that, that, you know, we are supporting kids and we are, we are listening to them. They are actual human beings. I know there's some people that really don't believe that, but, um, you know, just because someone is younger doesn't necessarily mean that their, um, experience is less valid or that they, um, are not advocating for themselves. Other times you'll also see kids advocate for smaller things and and try to test out you know who is a safe person or what is working and um if we are constantly shutting down you know smaller attempts for self-advocacy they're not going to suddenly start doing these big huge hurdles of advocacy or if we're doing everything you know for them instead of trying to help teach children as much as we can within their their abilities to be able to advocate for themselves at a young age that they're not just going to suddenly when they hit transition age and now they're suddenly supposed to start doing this planning with their IEP or whatever it may be doing that on their own if we haven't been empowering them all along um as far as just an autistic kid in general not advocacy related you know one thing that I wish I had known or someone shared me that you know my my brain's not broken um and that there are things that are challenging for me and that's okay. It's okay to ask for help. Um, it doesn't you know, mean that there's necessarily something wrong with you. Um, and then also, you know, think again about um, common autistic traits, you know, that are areas of passion or a special interest, you know, that someone, not everyone may be as excited about you, you know, as not everyone may be as excited about like medieval weaving or types of moss as you are, but your people are out there you will find your people um, and, you know, potentially that area of interest can lead to a lifelong passion or it might just be a particular area of interest for you now, but your people are out there. And in doing this, it's hard. And I mean, the same advice that you'd be giving to a child is, is that oftentimes the same advice we need as adults is how do you how do you get that confidence to to put yourself out there? Um, are there safe people? Are there ways to be able to share your narrative in a way where you feel like you can empower yourself, but do it on your pace, on your schedule? Um, and, and the resources aren't always there. It's, uh, I mean, as a personal story, my, my daughter went through this at her, at her high school and um, she saw where she, she felt and talking to some of her friends is that they felt like the school was using them to clean up after their peers and that mm -hmm. wasn't appropriate. 
And um, the peer set felt that that was normalized. And well, yeah, mm-hmm. no, that's a skill that child needs. It's like, well, why wouldn't you need that? Why wouldn't this be something that's common? But my right. daughter didn't know where to go. And to give her a voice, it was kind of, well, I could go do this for her. I could teach her how to be able to make sure that she can share that appropriately, talk to the right people and communicate. But the fear of retribution, mm-hmm. the, the fear of being ostracized, the fear of others not joining your your passion were things that held her back. I mean, what resources are out there that you could provide to you know families to help encourage themselves or the process of being able to explore some of these identities that you have and also explore some of the advocacy efforts? Are there ways that that you can share some of your information um, or is there other places to reach out to that can empower an individual? Oh, for sure. I mean, when we're looking at like education, you know, one thing that I always bring up is for um, most school districts, at least in the U.S., they have special education citizens advisory councils or boards or something related to the special education area. And um, while our particular school has wonderful formal meetings, a lot of the times, you know, the most value I found is in uh, the times before or after those those monthly meetings talking with other parents and caregivers and hearing, you know, their experience within the same school system or, you know, nearby school system or a kid of similar age or with a similar diagnosis or or support need background. Um, And just like we said with advocacy, you know, there's, there's very few things I think that we go through in life that no one has ever experienced before. It's just a lot of times we don't necessarily know it. And so finding that connection and talking with other people um, and learning you know, what has worked for them and what hasn't worked for them. But also sometimes they're just folks, you know, the more people you interact with and you're like, oh, I, I didn't even know that was a thing or like, I didn't know that's not what it was supposed to be like, you know, so learning some of those things as you get, you know, children and growing up learning, you know, that that it is okay to, um, you know, have these feelings or have these thoughts or you shouldn't be treated this way and this, this is not appropriate, you know, learning some of those skills and behaviors are really important. Um, but also as you know, parents, there's a lot of times where you don't know what you don't know. And so finding other folks that have been through similar life experiences, but maybe in a slightly different place can help support you. And then in the hopes, you know, that you would give that back to the community and kind of turn around and help the person behind you as well. Are there are there resources? Are there are there groups that you recommend for people to make sure that they're a part of um, to be able to start these discussions in their own community? It sounds like you've done it really well in Harford County, um, and just even as the uh, distracted autistic, autistic is that you you have a voice. You've been able to um, make sure that you have a way to include others. Um, where can where can others learn about? these sorts of resources or how they can potentially start to build this in their own community? One thing that has been new for me is um, the ARC of the United States has a program called Partners in Policymaking. And um, I recently got accepted into Partners in Policymaking um, for the state of Maryland. Technically, we've already met, but we say the the cohort of class of 2024. And the, the goal is for folks who are either um, have an intellectual or developmental disability themselves or a family member talking about advocacy, talking about um, some of these things we've discussed in a structured program that is free to the um, individual, um, learning about, you know, advocacy skills, being able to practice things, but then eating, um, you know, attending like a session for us in the capital of Annapolis, but um, being able to to speak with um, folks, you know, in our local legislature, and then also um, later on the program, it goes into federal advocacy as well. And that that's a really great resource. Um, there, it's funded by different agencies, you know, different states, and obviously it's not um, necessarily an international program. But I believe the state of Minnesota. I can see if I can find the link has a really good. Um, website that folks can kind of work through some of the different modules to at least get some history and um, understanding and explanation 
of some different things because uh, there are some things that are definitely, you know, state specific, different laws, stuff like that. But um, how, you know, laws are become laws and like how different um, bills, you know, get changed away that some of those things are, are the same um, elsewhere. It's not just state specific. Um, and then obviously getting into, you know, U.S. federal law as well. Well, Katie, I appreciate your, your knowledge and your ability to be able to kind of paint the picture of how important it is to have a community that is discussing a variety of issues and is open minded and is is talking through different perspectives. Um, I, I wish we could clone that and, and kind of create it all over the place, but these are skills and these are things that we can all develop over time. But um, I appreciate the fact that you came on and, and were able to talk with us today. And and hopefully is that everybody had a chance to be able to, to learn a little bit, but then also be able to kind of encourage that continue exploration of how to be able to immerse some of these skills into their life. So um, thanks very much. We appreciate your time. Thank you. I really appreciate your time today. Thank you for listening to Autism Weekly. We hope you tune back in next week to learn more about autism in the real world. Autism Weekly is now found on all the major listening apps, including Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Amazon Music, and more. Subscribe to be notified when we post a new podcast. Autism Weekly is produced by ABS Kids. ABS Kids is proud to provide diagnostic assessments and ABA therapy to children with developmental delays like autism spectrum disorder. You can learn more about ABS Kids and the Autism Weekly podcast by visiting ABS Kids. Dot com. Thanks for tuning in. See you again next week.